So welcome to this month's Deep Adaptation q and I'm Professor Jen Bendell, uh, the founder of the Deep Adaptation Forum, uh, and I host these Q&As every month uh, with someone who I invite to explore different dimensions of deep adaptation, or, or rather explore issues which I think are really important for the deep adaptation community. Some religions are beginning to wake up more and more to our predicament, but for the most part, I think it's um, still underestimated and most religious groups are not willing to dive full on into, into the questions that we are facing. And it's a difficult thing to do, isn't it? When suddenly people, everybody wants someone with the answers. Everyone wants someone to give them a pep talk. And, and you know what? Excuse me. They don't want it. They don't want your answer. Basically, mm. they ask as if they want. But what they, in their deepest heart, they want to hear the voice inside them. Yes, very beautifully put. I, I had a, an experience recently at a, at a camp. Um, where after a Q and A, um, there were quite there were parents of of young children, and they were particularly troubled by this. Uh, and I have no answers, and no answers at all about about. But so the only answer was simply to offer a space. And 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 Katie and another camp member, they just hosted the space, and it was an invitation for people to share their emotions. You so are a brave man. And that is exactly uh, what I find so admirable and so persuasive. You, you never seem to hear from any leaders that, 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 that of, spirit, of a spiritual bent that go, it's definitely going to be okay or it's definitely going to be bad. And, and, and the way I take that is, it really is down to us, you know. And, and, and it's better it's like that because whenever we think hopefully somebody else is going to sort it out mm. or hopefully it's not as bad as we think, we're just handing over something. And um, that you, I, I, I wouldn't sit, if, if, my child, if I saw my kid in the middle of the road and a bus coming, I wouldn't sit there hoping they'd be all right, would I? I'd just run like fuck to try and knock them out of the way. You know, that's, yeah, I mean, that's... this is the criticism of hope that it somehow, in, in normal parlance, it kind of means a passive wish for a better future. Fear is um, the biggest driver for all of the brutality in our lives it's, um, and in our world. Uh, you know, we collude with the light every single time we feel, feel any kind of fear in our lives. So when we're connected with ourselves, there's no fear. There's no scarcity. There's no fear of money, no fear of relationships, no fear of speaking our truths, no fear of being different, no fear of collapse, no fear of death. What do you mean when you say self-connection, connection with self, is that S, self with a big S and a bit more of a mystery? With a big S. With a, S. Well, yes, we'll call it spirit. I don't know, what, what, whatever language works for you. This feeling I have about the future uh, being so bleak, uh, also so uncertain, but also something that I don't seem to really have much ability to influence, that is unbearable. I think that um, in this context, we, we have um, a particular problem with, with agency. So that's the big difference that, that, that um, with, well, certainly with what you've just highlighted, which is that a major feature of what, what um, burdens people when they're grappling with, with eco-anxiety or whatever, whatever we want to call it, um, is that um, they feel, they tend to feel powerless. If justice is um, a teleological process from A to B, right? So, okay, I'll do that and it's going to be a checklist and lots of people ask for checklists. A checklist so, so that I can feel good about myself again, right? So that I, I don't feel complicit. This is actually part of the problem, right? So we are all, in, if we're all in the same metabolism, we are all complicit with the metabolism being sick, we're all sick. And therefore, we need to start from a grown-up position, not an infantilized position, because the house actually itself infantilizes us to be able to want to stay in the playground, right? To feel good, to look good, to do good, and to move forward. What about, instead of moving forward, digging deeper? 
and uh, taking responsibility so that in viscerally, not just for our species, but for all species, so that um, if there is a chance this can be interrupted, uh, we will do what is needed rather than what we want to do. So um, there are structural reasons why the economy needs to grow in order to be healthy. Mm. Uh, and one of them is, uh, we think, uh, economists disagree about this. Um, one of them is that uh, since all money is debt, we need to constantly borrow more money into circulation to pay back the debt, as you said. And the other one uh, is that uh, the money is going into tax havens, so we need to constantly borrow more money to replace yeah. the medium of exchange. So uh, structurally, the economy needs to grow. It's not a choice. It's not because people are greedy. It's not because countries are competing with each other that they need to grow. Mm. If the economy isn't growing, things start to break. And yeah. so the changes that are needed are very, very deep. Thank you for that softball question. Uh, I think that the, that the danger is that we jump into solutions out of a kind of an urgency and out of a partial understanding that that are actually that actually make the situation worse. For example, biofuels. Um, today, I'm going to talk to a Romanian activist who is pretty upset about like the convoys of logging trucks taking Europe's last old growth forest to the wood chipping plant to be burned in converted coal plants that then get carbon credits for sustainable energy. So like biofuels taking over enormous tracts of land in Africa, Asia, and South America to convert the world into fuel. I was just reading about um, a silver mine in Mexico that covers 100 square kilometers uh, that has just eaten into the mountains, destroyed pretty much every living thing on those 100 square kilometers, has a, <clears throat> has a, um, like, several square kilometer waste pond surrounded by a, a wall 50 stories high to contain all of the toxic waste that then of course sinks into the groundwater table. Um, and the article I read said in order to produce enough silver to meet all of, to convert fully, you know, off fossil fuels, we need 130 mm -hmm. mines like that just for silver, not to mention right. cobalt, not to mention copper, you know, um, molybdenum, et cetera. So, so that's a big challenge to the, the eco-modern idea of progress and our ability to control nature in a way that means that we can fix this. And often the children are very clear-sighted that I speak with. They're very empathetic. They're very compassionate. But they are no way near as frightened as a lot of the adults. Um, yeah. And the children are frustrated by this kind of patronizing discourse that says, don't frighten the children. Well, actually, you know, my response to that is always, the children are already frightened. Um, I, I go out to do these research interviews. Let me give you an example. I went to do this research interview with a 10 year old boy just over a year ago. And when I arrived, his dad opened the door and said, well, he said, I don't think he knows much about climate change. And I said, okay, well, we'll see. And I encouraged the parents to stick around and listen in. And there's quite a process of, you know, talking this through. And obviously my, my, my job is not about scaring children. So I'm using a, a set of questions which enable the child to play with these painful, frightening things, but not get traumatized in the process. And what I noticed was the child was relishing the opportunity to talk about this and the parent was horrified because the parent had no idea that his child was even thinking about these things, let alone had this knowledge. So at the end of it, the parent was terrified and the child told his dad later that was the most fun he'd had in weeks. We're in a place where all really is lost it's like it's like sitting at the bedside of someone that you love and it's they're on their deathbed are you going to hold anything back at that time absolutely not you know you're going to tell them how much you love them you're going to they're going to see it in your eyes and in your body and in your presence and you're you know anything left unsaid you're going to say it you're not going to hold anything back and i feel like that's a silver lining of this crisis where 
whatever it is that we each are doing to love the planet and care for it and be of service in our lives, uh, it's clearly the time to just let her rip. Uh, don't hold anything back. And I think, you know, those who are more activist inclined, uh, if you're not going to put your body on the line for what you believe in now, then you probably never will. I actually got glandular fever, which is not something that people in their 20s normally get. And it, um, and the funny thing is, is I didn't really know I had glandular fever. And I remember I was lying on the floor and the people that were hosting the TEDx talk were terrified <laughs> that I was going to mess up the event. And I was like, no, no, I'm just saving energy. And then... And then I got up and I did the talk and the talk was fine. Uh, it's not perfect, but it was okay. And, and then I realized after that I had glandular fever. And I realized how I pushed myself so much, even though I'd had glandular fever, all from this motivation of wanting to make the world a better place. And that was ridiculous <laughs> and completely unnecessary that led me to just making this very clear decision that I would make my spirituality the core of my life and that everything else would come from that. And so, yes, I need a certain amount for my physical needs, but beyond that, what I need to do is to develop my own inner treasures and to know that my happiness is within. And on a very practical, external level, it then means I can simplify. I just don't need all the external trappings that are available in materialistic societies today. And so I can simplify all of that and reduce my carbon footprint considerably by doing that. And there's more available for others to benefit from, to share. But I also become more free whilst I'm trapped by wanting and needing a lot of things externally, I'm trapped by those things. And I'll feel very distressed and very unhappy if any of those things are missing in my life. If I've simplified my life and learned to have the happiness within that comes from that inner state of contentment, then I'll be able to manage my life in a much better way. The notion of manufacturing a soft dis dissent seems to me to be uh, um, fundamentally erroneous. Um, we've had over the last few months kind of seven to ten percent drop in economic activity, maybe as much as 14 by the end of the year, which is roughly speaking the absolute minimum that even hopelessly conservative organizations like the IPCC would have said what was necessary year on year for the next 10 to 20 years to give us a tiny chance of avoiding the worst, the worst effects of, of, of climate change. Now, when you see what that has actually meant, and when you, and when you see how desperate um, society is to get back to normal, you realize that at no point was there actually any chance of agency in all of this. There was the delusion of agency. You know, we'll manufacture green cars or electric planes or mm. something like that. So basically, think of it like this. So oppression is the cause of all these different things. Climate emergency, uh, racism, sexism, adultism, when adults think they're better than young people, and disabledism and all those things. So oppression is the cause of that. And what Etzar did is they said, we're going to look at the climate and ecological emergency. And just to say, um, as a point of view, why is this one the emergency? That's, that's like a really big question. Like, like oppression has been oppressing people in so many different ways. And now some white middle class people come out and say, uh, this one is the emergency now. We, we have to work on this one. So what, what will co-liberation look like as a project or activity or message within Extinction Rebellion and from Extinction Rebellion? So the idea of, of co-liberation is that the fundamental understanding, um, or, or I'd say the essence of, of 
the, the, the co-liberation, the, the, the understanding that liberation can't be done individually and that individual solutions, like me going on a decolonizing training or that individualizes the issue, is, is so limited. The co-liberation understands that your safety depends on mine and mine on yours, as does my flourishing. That liberation is never only one way or one group. It can't be done like that. The fact that we cannot control everything we like to control is very fundamental and it will happen every day. Um, and we have to learn to get in, in peace with that. We better are, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, <clears throat> Vipassana has two goals, namely, bring down the daily stress, concentration, serenity, that's the first one. And the second goal is insight, understanding the mechanisms of your own mind, of the mind of others and mechanisms of the world. I think it's clear, absolutely clear, that we need uh, system change, that we need uh, transformation. And in fact, I can put the point more strongly. Um, the, the reason why I say this civilization is finished is that we're going to get a uh, system change. The question is, are we going to get that change through some kind of more or less intelligent voluntary process? Or are we going to get it through a chaotic collapse? Or are we going to get it through something uh, in between? Um, so um, uh, vast uh, change uh, is coming. Um, uh, most of what the the current system is trying to do is to hold off uh, that change and it is not going to succeed it is not going to succeed so is there anything that we 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 can do to invite people to be and um, practicing a more engaged spirituality at, mm. as things get more difficult mm. well i am encouraged to see that at least in um the students who come to uh, the program where I've been teaching for the last 23 years, um, the philosophy, cosmology, and consciousness program, <clears throat> that um, you know, the, the students have always been uh, interested in inner transformation and in expansion of consciousness. Mm -hmm. But they are all uh, now very aware of the, the existential threat that we face. I mean, they were generally before, but now it's like universal. Um, so I'm encouraged that that all, all of the people that I see now uh, in, in the Bay Area, not all, but more and more who are committed to and interested in personal transformation and spirituality are simultaneously aware of and committed to uh, transformation in the social and political realm. It felt like a good time to offer extra support. People, many people were isolated, alone at home, um, and to offer a place of connection. And very specifically, um, I mean, the breath, the breath is, is fundamental to so many spiritual traditions. Uh, I would venture to say it's fundamental to all of this understanding. Um, and so this, I had this strong sense that although we were each isolated in our own homes, that we were still sharing the same breath. And so that by drawing attention to that, that as we sing together, as we breathe together, we could really start to increasingly experience that this, this sharing of the breath and that um, even our, our isolation um, is at, at some level illusion because we are not separated um, because at the very most basic level, the breath that we're breathing, my out breath, becomes your in breath. Pe people change organizations. And, and I think one of the key lessons I've learned from my own life is that, you know, we are all work in progress. 
you know, and, and, and the best way to impact and influence others is to model and embody that which you want to see, you know, and, and, and so, I mean, I've, I've sort of um, uh, look at, 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 at who I am in relationship to my colleagues. And, and so, you know, we know that ministries of health and WHO is a reflection of ministries of health is is uh, still highly uh, medicalized although that's that's changing um, it's 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 it can be bureaucratic it's hierarchical um, and so how do you begin to build relationships and 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 get people to sort of look at the parts of 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 the organization that we don't normally talk about and that's feelings that's emotions that's our relationships there's the wound um as a result of an of an event um you know so there's some sort of overwhelming threat um you know some sort of deep fear about survival and and also the thing which she emphasizes is that is about being alone with the hurt and i think that's a, an interesting point which we'll probably come back to um, um, and the fact that wounds that haven't healed are, 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 are um, they're kind of sensitive. So there's a kind of scar there, which, which if it doesn't heal is kind of, you know, so there might be a kind of hyper reactivity, so it can be, it can be triggered. So it's, it's the way that that then kind of dysregulates the nervous system. Can you tell us about the activities that you've developed through day of adaptation? Sure. Um, the actually a good segue is I remember when when we met in Bristol three years ago, uh, I was sharing the idea of day adaptation with Jim and you and I remember Jim being very sharp as he is he was he is uh, just asked me the question okay so you're going to do climate communication, uh, what are you going to do that's going to be so different from what all the other organizations or professional have been doing for decades. Uh, and that really put me on the spot. Um, so we had the board game and uh, since Corona, we actually went, so I want to show you guys this, a uh, one and a half meter, like sort of distance friendly board game. And in my mind, I always saw a Europe as a place of privilege, a place of um, um, non-suffering. And seven years ago, I moved to Europe and actually I was really shocked how much suffering there is in Europe. And I, I just, I just didn't, I just hadn't realized. And I realized that we remember our cultural collapses. I, I, I had a sense of actually Europe had a cultural collapse. You know, you lost a lot of your pagan tradition, you know, like very beautiful traditions that you had. It's still captured in some old songs, but you've been lost for, you've been lost that you you you've you don't remember many things uh, that we remember very painfully and in some ways because you don't remember it it's operating in, in i have a sense that it's operating in an unconscious way and it's hurting you more and when i realized that it made me so feel so compassionate i couldn't be in this you know the Kaufman triangle the perpetrator the victim and the savior and I couldn't be in that triangle anymore because, you know, like I wanted to celebrate that Extinction Rebellion and Deep Adaptation Movement, have so many white people because I felt that, no, they are going through that initiation. They are going from egocentric to ecocentric. They are remembering something. Feminist climate leaders, they, they tend to have a deep commitment to justice and quality. And, you know, when you're talking like boardroom experience, for example, research has shown this. It's not your technical knowledge, it's your people knowledge that's going to, um, that's going to, you know, really ultimately determine whether you're successful or not. So having emotional intelligence is necessary too. And this is the biggest challenge that humanity has ever grappled with. And we're not going to solve it, like I said, from our prefrontal cortex alone. Mm. We need to come at this as whole human beings. That means the grief, the uncertainty, the rage, the anxiety but also the love, you know, the uh, two sages were walking in the forest and they saw a deer with an arrow stuck in it. And they got into this conversation of where did the arrow come from? Of what wood was it made? What was the speed from what direction? And the Buddha came walking and just plucked the arrow out of the deer. 
because we just need to alleviate suffering. So it is amazing how much when when threatened or uncomfortable, we just focus on greater measurement. <laughs> that if we try and push away the horror and seek only the beauty, we'll come unstuck. Because in pushing away the horror, it intensifies it both for us and for others. And in seeking only the beauty, we push it away because the energy of that grasping or pushing gets in the way. And so uh, there's a lovely, a Sufi story here, uh, Yeshua bin Maryam, Jesus, son of Mary, is walking towards Jerusalem towards day, and he sees a group of people whose pains and faces are full of pain and agony. And he says, what's the matter with you? And he, they say, master, master, we spent all our lives trying to avoid suffering. <laughs> and he, he says, oh, yes, he blesses them and walks on. Then he meets another group whose faces are also full of pain and ag agony. And he says, why are you like this? He says, master, master, we spent all our lives only trying to be happy. And he blesses them and walks off, avoids suffering. And he walks on, uh, meets another group who have pain etched onto their faces, but also joy. There's a balance there of both of them. And he says, why are you like this? He said, master, we gave up trying to avoid suffering and experience only joy and we found peace. And he says, truly you have found them kingdom of heaven, blesses them and walks on. And when I kind of, that's a lovely Sufi story that suggests what you're, I mean, we learn to hold both. Don't get into battle with pushing the one away or grasping at the other. And so there has been a, a shift, which I've been part of over the last decade with a number of people trying to bring in this notion that risk is not a thing. It's, it's part of a process. It, it, let's think of it more in, a, in the context of a verb that actually what we do as humans, how we choose to build things, what we choose to study, what we choose to model, how we choose to invest in things, how we choose to make policy, actually they are the drivers that actually then impact on natural processes, atmospheric processes, oceanic processes, even tectonic processes, which then create more hazards but it's us creating the vulnerability by choosing to live in silly places and to live in those places in silly ways. Very few places in the world have actually come to terms with and built and created their societies in a way which is compatible in any way with the sorts of risks which they're exposed to. And so there has been a move towards, okay, can we get away from just trying to model things and have these perfect answers? which were never perfect answers, but people believed in them because they wanted the certainty, to actually, can we be in sort of a mutual, uh, non-knowing, uncertain space where we can bring many different perspectives, not just the, the science-y perspectives, the more mathematical perspectives, the Newtonian physics perspectives, but actually some of the more the indigenous ways of knowing, the relational ways of knowing. I remember, um my first reaction was like oh you know you were you were speaking about oh maybe in, in 10 years time civilization collapses and then you know even people like you and me we might be gone in that process uh it might mean death actually and and i remember asking myself well what if this is true what if i'm one of those people that will just die in this process of um, civilization collapsing and I said to myself, well, then I better make sure I live until that happens. Um, and then I asked myself, but what does it mean to live? How do I know I have lived a full life? And my answer was, well, I feel alive when I feel connected, when I feel fully present and engaged with other people, with nature, with myself. Um, and then does it really matter if I die tomorrow or in 10 years or in 50 years? If connection is what makes me feel alive, then that's what I should commit to and live according to. And I should follow this thread of experience. And that's called mere reflection. Yay Tao, thank you for joining us this Sunday. Thank you. How about that, joining on a Sunday? I think that's proof, isn't it, that uh, this isn't just a day job. This is um well then, <laughs> I guess that's quite normal, you know, for us academics. Why why are you working on something 
that's not going to make you rich? What's wrong with you? <laughs> well, I think、uh, if one is genuinely interested in trying to solve this problem, one would have realized that continuing the current paradigm, capitalistic exploitation of resources of humans, will just lead to nowhere. And we are basically on the cusp of, you know, societal、uh, decay due to、um, overuse of resources and the environmental conditions that support life. I think every every council could set up、um, tool sharing and things. You know, so one one of the big problems we have is we absolutely need to reduce consumption massively, and that's not going to happen. Government aren't going to do anything about that. That you know, corporations aren't going to do anything about that. But at a local level, we could be sharing stuff a lot more. We could be eating together more. We could be playing together more. Festivals and you know, councils do. Quite a lot in making the places that people, yeah, ma- making the the spaces that locally are so colourful and vibrant, music, art, and things like that. You know, if, if the place you live is is a great place to be, you don't need to、yeah. go somewhere else. A place, a place that you don't need to take a holiday from. He was advocating against railing against the、um, perpetrators of the condition that we're in, and more、um, uh, instead of building animosity between sides, is is actually、um, his words were instead of railing, build personal and community resilience ahead of what's coming, ease the suffering, save what can be saved, and the. The feminine part of that, to me, is that、um, there is something to be birthed. <laughs> there is something that that yet still will come through if it has the spaces, and the tending, and the nurturing of that is to me a feminine quality.、Um, and if we spend our whole time trying to fix or get back to um, um, or be.、Uh, Activated to, to for new solutions, w- we won't drop into the the work of of restoration. And in the first twelve months that I was a member of the forum, I joined my local government. I became a town councillor. I worked with others in my small community around community food growing in the shape of、uh, allotments in an orchard. We started a Uh, repair cafe to reduce waste going to landfill and to reconnect older members of the community with incredible skills with youngsters with broken bicycles and clocks and so that was an incredible initiative through the pandemic we fed 120 local aged people who were、um, isolated and alone. And we set up a buddy system on the telephone so that people were getting regular telephone calls from other community members now. None of those things, really, apart from perhaps growing food, has anything to do with societal collapse. But they all have an incredible benefit in terms of building community. And Kudman has been part of our culture for hundreds of years,、uh, and that is a community self-help, where we all are part of the community, and it happens in many, many places around the world where there isn't a lot of money. You know, there isn't a big market that sort of mediates relationships and commerce between people. So when there isn't a lot of money and everyone is really kind of in the same position, we have to help each other. We need each other, and so there is this tradition, and it's how my ancestors survived. You know, as slaves、uh, and as maroons,、uh, you had to be in each other's lives in an intimate way and sharing your skills and knowledge. Nika has a long tradition. We call it kudme. Uh, Kudme is the Creole word for lend a hand, and it's just it's a an informal way of of being together and living and exchanging、um, skills and knowledge and, and services, and it's really the glue that、uh, keeps the community together.、Um, it's a social glue, and I think that we've really lost that、uh, in industrial complex societies because you don't have to rely on your neighbors. You have Walmart down the street, you know. Certainly, religions are supposed to, in their very nature, provide us a sense of salvation. They're they're helping us solve a lived experience problem, and there is hope 
in having that solution. Um, and I think it takes a mature faith and spiritual practice to consider that um, there are different ways of defining hope. <laughs> Once you step into thinking of the living world, not as a community, a, a kin, you know, the, 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 as Daniel Wildcat says, mm -hmm. we are surrounded by relatives, not resources. So once we begin to think of the living world as merely resources, you know, for us and a place for our waste, we've already stepped into an ecocidal trajectory that's guaranteed to go through the boom, the rise and fall, boom and bust cycle. But then radical love is love without any expectations. You drop all expectations in return. You don't expect anything. And so it's unconditional. And radical love is even loving person who you may not like. So for example, uh, people like Mahatma Gandhi or Martin Luther King, or people who were fighting against imperialism, colonialism, racism, sexism, all these sort of things. And yet they were embodiment of love. My, I had a great honor and, and a privilege of meeting Martin Luther King. In his uh, 10 years of activism, he was arrested for 29 wow. times. And yet, when I met him, he was sort of oozing with love, kind of uh, embodiment of love. So that's what I would call radical love. 